turn the volume up just a little bit so you can all hear me. Welcome to the Bathhouse Lecture Series put on by the Friends of the Hull Public Library, the Hull Life Saving Museum, and the Department of Conservation and Recreation. I know many of you have already been here before, so you know the drill, but we have um, coffee and desserts over here up front, so if you want, please feel free to help yourself. Um, the donations that you give us are graciously accepted. These uh, donations go to help pay for our speakers that we have here every month, so they're much appreciated. Um, I'd also like to thank tonight Hull Cable Access Television for coming down and for taping this evening's lecture. Uh, they'll be playing the lecture on cable access television, so if you and had any people that missed it, you can send them there and they can um, check out the lecture at a later date. I'd also like to thank Buttonwoods Books. Um, we have uh, a representative from Buttonwoods in the back who will be selling uh, books this evening, so if you're interested in purchasing one of those, you can do so right in the back. So thank you, Buttonwoods. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, although for many of you, she doesn't need an introduction. Hank Phillippe Ryan is the investigative reporter for Boston's NBC affiliate. A TV journalist since 1975, she has won 28 Emmys and 12 Edward R. Moreau Awards for her work. Her work has resulted in new laws, people sent to prison, homes removed from foreclosure, and millions of dollars in restitution. She is the best-selling author of five mystery novels and has won the Agatha, Anthony, and McCavity Awards for her crime fiction. Her newest thriller, The Other Woman, and the topic of this evening's lecture, was named to several Best of 2012 lists. She is on the Natural Board, National Board of Directors of Mystery Writers of America and an instructor at the MWA University. She's also president of the National Sisters in Crime. Please join me in welcoming Hank Phillippe Ryan. Thank you so much. That was just perfect. Love, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm testing the mic now. Thank you. Thank you, honey. My husband brings me the book. <laughs> How nice is that? What a guy. Um, it's really terrific to be here today. I'm going to move this because I'm just going to change everything. Does that, can, are you still okay? And uh, no, the television camera's going, yes, I am still okay. <laughs> it's all fine, thank you very much. Um, it's so great to be here in Hull. I was telling somebody the story of when my husband and I got lost in Hull a couple of years ago, several years ago before we had GPS. So we're driving back to Boston, back to Newton, from somewhere on the South Shore. And we had no idea where we were. So I'm the smart one, I'm the navigator, right? So I say, if the water is on the right, we're okay. If the water is on the right, we're going north. We're going north, so we can't, we can't be lost, it's fine. Eventually this is gonna come out somewhere because the water is on the right. So of course, where did we end up? We ended up at the end of the universe with water all around. And I said, I think we have to turn around. You know, those are the, that's the adventures that happen in Hull. So thank you. Um, I'll never forget that when we came, come back here, I, I laugh every time. With the water's on the right. That is how, the, my mantra. Um, I love being invited here. The, the bathhouse is amazing. I can't wait to look into the history of it. The museum, thank you so much for doing that. The DCR, um, which helps us, Massachusetts, stay beautiful. There are so many fabulous DCR places and they do such a good job. And the library, of course, I just came from the whole library where I spent part of the afternoon working on my new book. Um, in one of those big cozy leather armchairs in the room with the fireplace. So. It, it, the stained glass windows are gorgeous. I was looking at them when I should have been working. Um, so thank you, extra special thank you to the Hull Library because um, you're gonna be in the book now. You know, libraries have been, well, first of all, thank you so much for coming. Um, it's, you have lives and you have things to do and you have responsibilities and every, it's not just me, but every author will tell you, um, we worry. I can tell you that because it's just us. We worry that no one will ever show up at these events. <laughs> you know, it's like when you have a party and you know, five minutes before the party you think, 
nobody's gonna come. Uh, that's, how we, that's how we authors feel every time. So to see you all here, and to know that you've made the decision to give up whatever you were gonna do tonight, watch Project Runway or whatever, don't go, It'll, <laughs> you can tape it, or whatever's on tonight, that you decided to come here instead, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know you may be at home and think, oh, she'll never know. That, that author will never know if I, if I didn't come. Um, but we do, we do, we do know. So thank you. Uh, libraries have been such an important part of my life since I was a little girl. I grew up in really rural Indiana, outside of Indianapolis. Um, so rural that you couldn't see any other houses from our house. And we got to the library as kids. My sister and I got to the library by riding our ponies into town and bringing back our books on the packs on the back of our ponies. I know I sort of turned out to look like kind of a city girl, but I grew up way in the country. We'd bring back our library books and then go up to the hayloft in our barn to read, and that's how I learned to love books and learned to love solitude a little bit. Um, and then growing up as, as a reporter, when I became a reporter, of course, um, the librarian was like, you're right behind a post, do you want to move? Are you, are you okay? She's hiding back there. She's, she sticks her head out and makes funny faces. It's all right, but just don't surprise me. Um, grow, you know, as a, as a reporter, there was, uh, before Google and before the internet, there was nothing more critical than getting information right, of course, and there was no other way to find it except for going to the library myself during the day or calling a reference librarian, because who knows more than a reference librarian, and getting the info from the reference librarian. And I learned one of my tricks, which was, which was if I was working late, and it was too late for the libraries in Boston to be open, I learned that all I had to do was call California and talk to a reference librarian in California and get three more hours of work done. So it's worked out quite nicely. And you know, back in the day when I worked in, li when I wor worked in libraries at the first time, I, um, you had to use the microfiche, remember that? How awful that was? Who invented that? And the, and the, um, and the newspaper, I know, and the newspaper thing that you read, the scan, the newspaper, which you could never find anything, and there was no index, and it either crawled by or went a million miles an hour. And I have such a, a short attention span that I'd be distracted like by the ads. Oh look a hat. Two fifty for a hat. So interesting. Oysters for a nickel. Wow. And I never got anything done. So I do embrace how the how the world is now that libraries have been a, a huge part of my life from the very beginning. And imagine, you know, how thrilled I was the first time I actually saw one of my books in a library. You know, that was something that was such a treasure and something that was just never going to happen. And to actually see that was just a life-changing moment. You know, holding this up to you reminds me that um, this is my new book, as, uh, surprise, surprise. It's been on the Boston Globe bestseller list several times. It's now in a third printing. And it just got nominated for the Mary Higgins Clark Award and the Agatha Award for Best Mystery of 2012, so fantastic. Um, when I first saw the cover, my agent called me and she said, oh, wait, do you see that cover? It's fabulous. Um, it's so delicious, you could just eat it. And I, you know, it's for inside, inside, insider publishing stuff. It's em embossed and it's metallic. This is very good. If you see embossed and metallic, that means the author is happy. Um, but what was, so, the funniest part about it was, I didn't realize it was going to say, Hank Philip Ryan, the other woman. <laughs> things that you do not think about. And my next book, which comes out in the fall, um, is The Wrong Girl. <laughs> so if you'll all help me think of the third title, that would be something better. I would be gra very grateful about it. Um, it reminds me of, um, th looking at this, reminds me of a story that, I, you know, I'm an investigative reporter for Channel 7, a story that we did a couple of years ago about, we decided to do a story about headlights, not headlights. 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 I know you're like, what? <laughs> Headlights in cars and how they get less bright as time goes by. So you think, we think we're not seeing as well as we used to. But what's really happening is the, the, the plastic in the front of the headlights gets opaque and the actual light bulbs themselves get dimmer and less bright as time goes by. So we're driving in the rain thinking, oh, my eyesight is going, when really it's that the headlights are dim. 
So we did a story, a big investigative story, proving that this had hap has, was happening and proving that it was dangerous. And you know, so what happens at the end of a story, the last, the last thing that happens after a story is I, I did the research, I did the reporting, we did the shooting, I went down to, I did, went down to the edit booth and start, you know, made the little movie out of the book, um, out, of, out of the story. And the last thing that you do before a story is on the air, and you've seen this, is the reporter does the stand-up close, what's called the stand-up close, which means the close of the story. So you go down into the newsroom to stand in front of the camera to take this, what we call the tag, which is you'll say, um, the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission has agreed to look into this problem and we'll have more for you in an upcoming story, Hank Philip Uriah and Seven News. You've seen that, they stand with them. So I put on my spiffy little reporter suit and a whole bunch of makeup to stand, to come down and stand in front of the graphic that tells what the story is about. And you've seen that too, the graphic that says big fire or whatever it is, so you know what the story was about. So I get all ready and come down to the newsroom to stand in front of the graphic to do the story about the dangerous headlights. And I see the graphic says, dangerously dim. <laughs> And I have to stand in front of a graphic that says dangerously dim. So I looked at it and I burst out laughing like you did. And I went to my news director and I said, I can't stand in front of a sign that says dangerously dim. Look at that. And he burst out laughing too. And then he goes, yeah, we really don't have time to change that. <laughs> so I did. The only time that I've ever seen anything that's at least, well, maybe it was worse than that. We had a gorgeous anchor woman at Channel 7 who, don't tell, who had to, had to come down and do a story and stand in front of a graphic that said, botched plastic surgery. <laughs> so, so we love that. We play that at Christmas parties and stuff like that. So that'll give you a different way of watching TV. You know, look for the graphic irony. That will, that will help you. Anyway, I've been a reporter for 30 years. It's actually more than 30 years. Um, I've wired myself with hidden cameras. I've confronted corrupt politicians, chased down criminals, gone undercover in disguise. I've covered everything from fires and floods and hurricanes to the Celtics playoffs and cat shows and interviewed everyone from Muhammad Ali to Prince Charles to President Carter to Warren Beatty. So it's been a terrific time and I still am having a wonderful time um, doing that. Being a television reporter is one of the few jobs where you have no idea every day you have no idea what's going to happen when you go into work and that's a wonderful thing. There's the element of surprise every day. Um, and that's kind of a treat to not know what's going to happen every day. But the thing is, I never really planned on being a television reporter. When I got out of college, oh, so many years ago, when I got out of college, I decided that what I wanted to do was do something to change the world, do something that was good and lasting, something somewhere that I could leave a mark. So I decided to go to work in politics back home in Indiana where I grew up. And I worked in several political campaigns thinking that this was the way to change the world. I know. <laughs> sadly, yeah, oops, sadly, um, no candidate that I ever worked for actually won election. And this is one of those moments in your life when you think, perhaps I have made the wrong career choice. You know, perhaps I need a plan B. But I sort of have this um, abiding philosophy that when something bad happens to you, something that you are disappointed or unexpected or not what you wished for, that something good will happen as a result. Doesn't that happen when the one thing that you're hoping for doesn't happen, you think, oh, I'm doomed, I'm miserable, my life will never be okay. Soon after, and sometimes very soon after, something wonderful happens as a result. And that is, that's actually how I got my first job in broadcasting. Um, I had worked for a guy who was running for governor of Indiana. He lost and he was unemployed and I was also unemployed. So I needed a new job. You have to imagine 20 year old me, uh, unemployed and terrified. So I went to the biggest radio station in Indianapolis and applied for a job as a radio reporter. I'd never been a radio reporter, doesn't matter. So the news director, I figured I could do this. So the news director says to me, Okay, you're, you have to imagine this is 1970, and I'm a kid. I'm a kid who has no fear and no idea that someone will ever say no. 
So I go into the news director and say, I'm here to apply for a job as a radio reporter. And the news director says, so, okay, do you have any experience? And I'm beginning to see what the problem is going to be here. <laughs> So he says, have you ever been a reporter? No. Have you ever done an interview? No. Have you ever written a news story? No. Have you, did you work for the school paper? No. Did you work for the yearbook? No. Did you ever take journalism? No. He's looking at me like, why are you here? So I said, well, you know what? I really want to do good. I really want to change the world. I really don't have any experience, kind of the kind of experience that you're talking about. But I grew up here in Indiana, and I know where all the streets are. <laughs> because you have to go with what you've got. Uh, and I said, Anne, one more thing. Your license is up for renewal at the FCC, and you don't have any women working here. And then I just smiled. <laughs> and the next day, I had my first job in broadcasting. Now, here's why, you know, here's why I will admit this to you. I mean, I will admit to you that I got my first job with no experience and just with sort of the gumption of a kid who didn't realize that was kind of nervy. But it's a fabulous story because so many of us who, start, who sort of were the first among the first women in broadcasting got started that way and at that time and we only got that job because we were women but I'm so proud to be part of that history of women sort of breaking the glass ceiling, the gender barrier, the gender barrier in broadcasting, Jane Pauley and Barbara Walters and Jessica Savage, Nancy Dickerson, Pauline Frederick, we all sort of started at the same time um, and we did it out of love and we did it out of nerve and we did it out of desire and passion. Um, it, it, it was an amazing experience. And who would have thought back in the day when there were only three networks, I mean, I guess there were four, but the second one, the fourth one, you had to turn two knobs, remember, <laughs> to sort of tune in the cartoons on UHF. Who would have thought back in the day when you had to get up to change the channel, right? <laughs> I mean, I do speeches and I say to people, um, to some crowds, and you had to get up to change the channel. And people in the audience go, no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you actually did. Who would have thought back in the day when you had to get up to change the channel that, you know, my boss is a woman and her boss is a woman and her boss is a woman and Katie Couric and Diane Sawyer anchoring, you know, Katie Couric was sitting in Walter Cronkite's seat. You know, and who would have thought back in the day that that would ever have happened? So I'm really proud to be a reporter and part of that and I've loved it for all these, it's now unbelievably 37 years that I've been doing this and, and still going strong and still, and still loving it. Um, but really, from the moment I read my first Nancy Drew book, I knew I wanted to be a mystery author. You read Nancy Drew, right? The clue, the clue in the old clock and the clue in the diary, remember that? Which I thought was clue in the dairy for like <laughs> the, for the whole book. And I'm reading it up in the hayloft going, shouldn't there be cows? <laughs> But I finally worked that out. So I moved on then to all the to Sherlock Holmes stories, which I adored, learning about how a story works and how a mystery works and how you can fool the reader and how you can try to figure it out if you have all the clues. And then I went on to all the wonderful British women authors, Niall Marsh and Josephine Tay, Marjorie Allingham, Dorothy Sayers, and you know, and Agatha Christie, you know, who I loved. And now, all these years later, my first book, Primetime, won the Agatha, named after Agatha Christie, for best traditional mystery. And you see, you know, I think about that, you know, that 13-year-old girl up in the hayloft reading Agatha Christie and dreaming. And then all these years later, it turns into that. So you just really never know exactly what's going to happen to you in life. Um, but I think after reading, after reading those mysteries, my passion for suspense and my passion for storytelling was born. That was it. We all know the feeling, if we're lucky, of, having, of sitting on somebody's lap when we're a kid and having someone say, once upon a time, once upon a time, and you know that feeling and you know the goosebumps you get and you know how the walls fall away and you're in a new world. And that's what I loved about those books. But my career took a different path and I didn't become a mystery author right away. I went into television journalism, as you know. And, but I, what I learned 
over the years is that whether it's writing fiction for a mystery thriller like I do, or writing nonfiction in journalism for television, it's really the same thing. Even though it seems it would be very different, I mean, one is made up and one is true, it, even though it seems like it would be very different, they're really very similar. Because whether it's fiction or nonfiction, when it's good, it's all about telling a great story. It's all about telling a great story with a wonderful main character who you care about, other characters who you love, a problem, a big important problem that needs to be solved. Whether it's television journalism or whether it's fiction, you're looking for the good guys to win, right? And the bad guys to get what's coming to them. And in the end, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you're looking to change the world a little bit. You're looking for justice. You're looking to make a difference in people's lives. And that's what I do every day on television as a journalist. And every day in my little office writing fiction, I try to change the world a little bit. I try to change your life a little bit. I want you to say, I could not turn the channel when her story was on TV. And I could not put that book down. That is all about a good story. Whether it's fiction or whether it's nonfiction, that's the same. Of course, in television, you can't make stuff up. You know, that's, that, that, don't laugh. You cannot make stuff up. <laughs> That's, that's really the big difference about it. And one of the things, you know, all of those Emmys that I, that I won so fabulously, all of those Emmys that we won on my shelf, I think of those as every one of those represents a secret, something that someone didn't want me to tell you, something that someone didn't want you to know. That's what those are. And that's the other thing that's so similar about journalism and, and about writing mystery thrillers, is they're all about secrets. Who has a secret? Who knows the secret? Who wants to find out the secret? What the secret is? And what will happen when that secret is revealed? And that is the key to the other woman, too. It's all about secrets. Now, another secret is how I got the idea for the other woman. And remember I told you about how I believe that out of something bad, something good always happens. That is exactly how I got the idea for the other woman. I needed a root canal. <laughs> and you're thinking, and I'm telling you that if I hadn't needed a root canal, this book would never have been written. <laughs> And that is true, and here's why. I needed a root canal, so I went into the dentist's office to, to wait for this, the endodontist to come in. He was late. My tooth hurt so much, I can't begin to tell you. So I'm sitting there in the dentist's office, and I will confess, I was very, very cranky. My tooth hurt. I was, he, the dentist was late, I wasn't at work, I was missing work, I was going to be way behind. It was all bad. Every minute of it was bad. And there was nothing good that could come out of it. So back then, in the waiting room, cranky, I picked up an old people magazine. Not an old people magazine. <laughs> an old issue of People magazine. You, you, knew, you knew what I meant. You knew what I meant. An old issue of People magazine. And in this magazine was an article about Mark Sanford, Governor Mark Sanford. You know who that I, I love when you nod and buzz, because that means you know who that is. Governor, ex-Governor Mark, now ex-Governor Mark Sanford uh, of South Carolina, was the one who told his wife and his family and his constituents and his employees that he was out hiking the Appalachian Trail, remember? When he was actually out with his uh, Argentinian mistress. I don't know why I say Argentinian mistress. It doesn't really matter. It just sounds exotic, I suppose, exactly. So anyway, here I am in the dentist's office, in pain, you have to remember, reading this magazine and thinking, why would somebody be the other woman? Why would they do that? You know, is it lust? Is it love? Is it power? Is it selfishness? Is it corruption? What reason would there be? Because it's such a dumb idea. It is such a dumb idea. Now, you have to remember, put yourself in the dentist's office with me. <laughs> Not really, but OK, theoretically. And so in my woozy state of pain, I began thinking about this. And I wondered, first of all, why someone would do that. Because you're going to get caught. You're going to get caught, whether it's by your spouse in the kitchen or reading about yourself on the front page of the New York Times, like General Petraeus and so many others. You're going to get caught. 
You're going to ruin your life. You're going to ruin the life of this man you ostensibly love, right? On purpose, you're going to do that. Remember, I'm just thinking this. I'm not telling you. Um, you're going to ruin his wife's life and his children's life and his constituent's life and his friend's life. And here's a guy who was governor of a state who had asked people to vote for him, who had asked people to trust him, to rely on him, and then he lied. So why would you do that? I mean, think about all of the women in politics, all the other women in politics whose names you know well, Elizabeth Ray, Riel Hunter, Kay Summersby, Donna Rice, I mean, Monica Lewinsky. Okay, so yes, and you laugh, first of all, there, I, I rest my case. Secondly, if, if Monica Lewinsky won the Nobel Prize, what would the headline be, right? You can, you know, Monica Lewinsky, ex-paramour of President Clinton, wins Nobel Prize. You know that. So this is a silly idea to be the other woman. So I, I'm obsessed by this now in my pain in the dentist's office. And I began to wonder, though, whether there might be some reason that I hadn't thought of yet some interesting, intriguing, compelling, unusual, unpredictable, fabulous reason why someone would be the other woman that I could make into an exciting page turner of a thriller. And I began to think about that. And then as I'm reading this article, one of the last, one of the last <laughs> quotes in the article was from someone who said, you can choose your sin but you cannot choose your consequences. And I just, I got goosebumps. I got goosebumps now telling you about it. I got goosebumps at the moment. So there I am in the dentist's office in pain with goosebumps thinking, my book, my book, my book. This is my book. You can choose your sin, but you cannot choose your consequences. And I can't resist. I'm going to show you this now. I mean, there it says on the cover, you can choose your sin, but you cannot choose your consequences from that moment in the dentist's office. So the other woman is about sex and secrets and duplicity and deception and fidelity and marriage and what it means to be a husband and what it means to be a wife, what it means to be a daughter and a son. It's also about how far someone would go to get what they want. And most of all, it's about consequences, about how every single thing we do reverberates and resonates and the dominoes fall. And even though you think you're making a good decision, it may not be. And even when you think you're doing the right thing, it's going to affect someone else. It's about consequences, how everything we do affects other people's lives. So quickly, let me tell you about this just a little bit. The Other Woman is the first in a new series. I know some of you, and I love you, have read my other four books about Charlotte McNally. Thank you for nodding. The, news, the, the television reporter, who, and she's fun and funny, and those are fast-paced murder mysteries. This is a suspense thriller, which introduces, this is the first in the series, introduces the reporter Jane Ryland. Jane Ryland is a television reporter who was fired for protecting a source. Jane refused to reveal who told her a particularly juicy bit of information. And as a result, her television station lost a million dollar lawsuit. So the, her station lost big money and Jane was thrown under the bus. And as the story begins, she is out of a job looking to redeem herself. So it's within two weeks of a pivotal senatorial election in Massachusetts, we've all been there, and Jane gets a low-level job as a reporter for a local newspaper. And she's assigned to cover the, this Senate campaign. And she begins, to, she begins to suspect that one of the candidates in the election is having an affair. Now, why does she think that? Because she sees the woman in a red coat. She sees the same woman in a red coat in newspaper archive photos in Swampscott and in Springfield and in Situate and in Boston and in Worcester. And she goes to the people in the campaign and says, who is this? Who is this woman in the red coat? And no one will tell her or else they're hiding it. Um, and so that makes her even more suspicious. But the thing is, remember, Jane's been fired from her job. And people think, people think she's made a mistake. People think she was wrong about a story. What if she's wrong again? What if there is no affair? What if the senator, what if the candidate is not having an affair? What if there's not another woman? She's going to ruin his life 
and the woman's life and her own life and ruin her career. So there's a lot at stake here. The other main character in the story is a Boston police detective, Jake Brogan. Jake is on the trail of two murders that took place in Boston. Both women's bodies were found under bridges, the Zakem and the Longfellow Bridge specifically. Both women were found with no shoes and no identification. And the media in Boston is clamoring that there's a serial killer on the loose. But Jake isn't so sure it's a serial killer. But Jake has a lot to prove. He's a newly minted police detective, brand new on the force. And if he tells the people of Boston that they're safe and they're not in danger, there is no serial killer, what if there is? What if there is? What if his own instinct has put everyone in danger? So he has a lot to prove, too. So Jane is on the trail of an ex-governor's secret mistress. Jake is on the trail of a potential serial killer. And when the third person killed, is a pivotal person in the campaign Jane is covering, they begin to wonder if they might be on the trail of the same person, someone who will stop at nothing to silence a scandal. So you'll see on the inside cover of the book, it says, seduction, betrayal, and murder. It's going to take a lot more than votes to win this election. And that is what The Other Woman is about. You'll recognize, now, this book uh, has been the best of 2012 for in San Sacramento, in Kansas City, and with the Boston Globe. The Sacramento Bee, the Kansas City Star, and the Boston Globe. Also, Suspense Magazine and Deadly Pleasures Magazine. Those are both mystery magazines. So the, I say that, not to pat myself on the back, although I'm very happy about it, but to show you that the, that the appeal of the book is broad, but, People who live around here, people who live in New England, will get a special kick out of this book because you will recognize every place that this story takes place. It's a murder mystery, it's a thriller, it's a fun, fast-paced book, and it is very local. You'll recognize the Esplanade and the Hat Shell, the State House and Boston Common. You'll recognize Boston drivers. Oh, you'll recognize the, I know. You'll recognize the Mass Pike. Jonathan and I, my husband Jonathan and I will be driving home on the Mass Pike and we'll be at exit 17, for instance, and I'll say, oh, exit 17, this is where Jane was chased by the bad guy in the truck. <laughs> and then I think, no, I made that up. <laughs> So it's so realistic to me that I could go on the Jake and Jane tour of Boston, and I hope you will too. But who'd have thought? You know, we all think we go to work we all, and do our jobs, and then that's the end of it. But who'd have thought that all those years that I worked in political campaigns, and then all those work, years that I worked in television, work in television in Massachusetts, that those jobs weren't the end in themselves, that those jobs were getting me ready for this. You know, how amazing is that? that that politics and reporting go into my books now, that it's fact and fiction together, although the books are made up, that it's fact and fiction together. It's such a joy, it's such a treat to blossom and realize what I was really doing. I mean, people say to me, do you do a lot of research for your books? And I say, sweetheart, I've been doing research for 40 years. You know, that is what this is all about. And that's one of the things I just want to make sure that you know tonight. I am the poster child for following your dreams in midlife. I didn't start writing fiction until I was 55 years old. I'm 63 now. At a time when you might think, you know, 55, you're fine, you've had a great career, you know, you've, been a one, you've had a good job as a television reporter, you've been a success, you don't need to do anymore. But I wanted to do, I wanted to do that. I knew that I had something that wasn't quite finished. You know what I mean? Do you know the, do you know the singer Judy Collins, the folk singer Judy Collins? Good, good. I, I mean, I loved her and, and grew up, you know, with her music. I, I told my producer, who's in her 30s, that, I was, that my husband and I were going to go hear Judy Collins at Sanders Theater at Harvard a couple of months ago. I told my young producer we were going to go hear Judy Collins, and she says, oh, great. <laughs> you know, no idea, no idea. So I said, you know, Judy Collins, the folk singer, she sang both sides now. I couldn't have gotten through college without listening to her records. And my producer says, records? <laughs> that's not true, I made that up. But that's pretty funny. Um, so we, but anyway, the point is, and I know you're wondering, what is the point? It's not that funny. My husband and I went to the Judy Collins concert at Sanders Theater, and 
she told the story, and this is apropos of that there was just something not quite left in my life. Not, there was something not quite finished in my life, something left to do. Judy Collins got up and, said, and told us that she, her parents had planned for her to be a concert pianist. That's what she had been trained to be as she grew up in Denver. Um, she had planned to be a concert pianist, and she had trained for that and worked for that and studied for that. And she knew, though, that that's not what she wanted to do. She said she always knew that she wanted to be a folk singer. And finally, she said, when she was 19, she said, I packed up all my stuff, and I moved to New York, and I took all my songs with me. And then she said, of course, I hadn't written any of them yet. <laughs> I know. And it, so it just touched me. And I think we all have songs that some of them might not quite be written yet. And that's what I want you, if you take nothing more from tonight, um, except my book, of, <laughs> of course. If you take nothing more from tonight, I want you to have the joy that I have of waking up in the morning and knowing that you followed your dreams, that it can be done, that if you wanted to write a book or write your memoirs, that book of poetry, or learn Italian, or go on vacation, or just start a new business, or start something new, just be the thing that you always loved, that it is never, it is never too late to do that. You know, when I, when I finished writing Primetime, my first book, I called my husband into the room, and I said, sweetheart, watch this, and I typed the end. And then I burst into tears. I burst into tears because I knew no matter what happened after that, I had followed my dreams. I had done something that I always wanted to do. Um, but of course, I shouldn't have cried when I typed the end because it wasn't the end at all. It was the beginning of this wonderful new second half of my career. And I'm so delighted to be invited here tonight to share that with you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Let me just, I think we're okay on time. Do we have time for some questions? Do we have time for some questions? Who has a question? Nothing, hot, nothing difficult though. We should just have some parameters here. I think in the back, just yell it up. How long does it take me to write a book? Um, that's such a good question, and I love it because I think about it all the time. I guess the first part of that answer is I think about the books all the time. So, from the most difficult part is getting the, the idea, that beautiful, glorious germ of the idea that begins the book. It takes about a year, I would say, after that. To write, to write a whole book. My first book, Prime Time, took about two years because I had no idea what I was doing. And also because I, it was 723 pages long. <laughs> and it can only be 323 pages long. So I had to cut, I was such a newbie, I had to cut 400 pages from my book. That was pretty amazing. It was. It was hilarious because I thought, whoa, I have another whole book here, so I don't have to, my second one will be so easy. And then I went back and looked at all, the th all that I'd cut out of the book, and it was ridiculous. You know, it was boring and derivative and not funny and silly and repetitive and all those things. So it was a good experience, but it takes about a year. If you're lucky and, I mean, I have a full-time job at Channel 7. So I go to work in the morning at 9 o'clock and come home, we get home about 7, and then I write at night for several hours and on weekends and in vacations. We haven't had a vacation for a long time. So how long would it take me to write a book if I didn't have another full-time job is a question that perhaps someday I'll be able to answer, but I have no idea. <laughs> Who else has a question? I just wanted to know how you found your publisher and then how the relationship developed with them. You obviously have a name in the community, so were there struggles with I want this in? No, it should be changed this way. Are you writing? Are you writing a book? No. I'm not. No. Okay. <laughs> he, he, he was asking how I found my publisher and what about and what are the push pull struggles of, of publishing? Um, and one of the things that I keyed in on that you said was you obviously have a name and so yap yap. No, that was that was not helpful. Newbie me again, the woman who wrote the 723 page book because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I assumed, and I can confess this to you, 
I assume that because I've been on television for so long and because I sort of have a, a known around here, that it would be very easy for me to get a publisher and that everybody would say, oh, Hank, we want her. And mostly they were saying, we have never heard of you and we don't care, is, is basically what it was. Um, writing a book, there was no leg up because of being a television reporter at all. In fact, some agents told me that um, when they get a manuscript from a television reporter, they toss it almost without reading it because the, one woman said to me, all you television reporters think you're such good writers and you have no idea. So she assumes they'll be bad. So quite the opposite of getting a leg up from being a tel by being a television reporter, it was, um, a, is there such a thing as a leg down? <laughs> Something like that. Um, I, got, I found my publisher by submitting manuscripts cold to agents till I finally got an agent who said yes. I was rejected, rejected, rejected. I think I got, I mean this is kind of wonderful because it's not so many. I was rejected 10 or 12 times before I got some, before someone said yes. And then when some, one person said yes, it felt like sort of everybody started to say yes. And it was wonderful and now I'm with Forge, a fabulous big six publisher with Macmillan, an imprint of Macmillan, which is wonderful and I'm thrilled. Um, and right now they can do no wrong. Whatever they want is great. I mean, look at the cover of the book. I mean, this is, it's, it's embossed, it's, you know, it's metallic. Um, so I'm very happy with that. So those kinds of things, um, what I really care about is writing the best possible book that I can. I really care about writing a book that you will not be able to put down. And my publisher understands that. That's what they want too. They love readers. They want readers. They want you to be happy. And they're doing everything that they possibly can to make you happy. And that makes me happy too. Who else? Yes. Have I, having grown up in rural Indiana, what? How did I end up in Boston? Oh, it's such a good story. It really is. Um, I got my first job, you know, in radio that I told you about by hook or crook. I got my first job on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. by going door to door, handing out resumes, saying, anybody need somebody who can pretty much do anything? I'm, again, I was 21. Handing out resumes, and I got a job on the Administrative Practice and Procedure Subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee which is sort of the fancy Washington title for um, the subcommittee that works on laws to figure out how the government works. And amazingly, by chance, now remember I'm from Indiana, and I promise you I'm gonna answer your question. Um, I'm from Indiana, and, but by chance I wound up in the office of Senator Kennedy, who was the chairman of that subcommittee. So for about a year and a half, maybe more, I worked with Senator Kennedy very closely and really got to learn what a genuinely fabulously, authentically good guy he was. Uh, and then I went to work for Rolling Stone magazine for a couple of years, then back to Indianapolis in television. Again, I had no um, experience in television, but back then he, the news director decided he could make me a television reporter because I had written for Rolling Stone. Um, my salary was $8,000 a year, $8,000 a year, and no contract. So if it didn't work out, you know, who cared? Um, so I worked in Indianapolis for a year, and then, and here we come to the, your answer, I know, finally, um, someone saw me, just like, in TV, just like in movies, a news director of a television station in Atlanta saw me anchoring the, the weekend news in Indianapolis and asked me if I'd like to move to Atlanta to anchor the news in Atlanta. So I moved to Atlanta for five years and anchored the news in Atlanta and was a political reporter in Atlanta for about five years. And then I got a job offer, um, at the, like essentially, surprisingly the same, I was gonna say the same day, but certainly the same week, from Boston, from San Francisco, from Washington DC, and from Dallas to be a reporter, anchor in all those cities. So I visited all the cities, and it was great and very glamorous, and picked Boston, by far picked Boston, um, and have been here since 1982. And that's how I wound up here. Television is a very nomadic, um, profession. When you start, I mean, that's why you start out at a really little market, Grand Forks, Iowa, or Ames, Utah, or whatever it is. And you work up and up and up to get to bigger jobs, bigger jobs, bigger jobs. That's what you do. So most people in television, the minute you get a new job, your goal is to get a better job, to, to get a better job someplace bigger. Um, but I, you know, I was offered a job 10 years ago at the network. Um, but I thought, you know what, I love Boston. I want to stay here. 
um, and, I, and I love what I do. So I'm, I'm here for the duration. Isn't that funny, though, how life works, how you never know what's going to happen? My husband and I um, don't celebrate the anniversary of the day we met. We celebrate the anniversary of the day before we met. And we call that you never know day. <laughs> because you never know what wonderful thing is around the next corner. And that's sort of how I feel about winding up here in Boston. Who else has a question? Anyone? Yes. What kind of books do I like to read now? Um, well, I just finished being a judge for um, a big mystery thriller contest. And do you know what it's like to judge the best thriller in the United States? A million books wind up, you know, they, everybody enters. And so the UPS guy is bringing these boxes. It looks like, ma'am, here's some more books for you. So I've read dozens and dozens and dozens, probably hundreds, of mysteries and thrillers over the past year, um, picking the best ones. If I, and if I had to choose, I probably would read mysteries and thrillers. I love them. I love the idea. One of the secrets, um, some good books that I've read recently, you've read Defending Jacob. Have you read, anybody read Defending Jacob? Yes, yes. Um, do you remember the benevolent silver-haired lawyer in Defending Jacob, the, the, the defense attorney who defends Jacob? That's actually based on my husband. If you, uh, there's Jonathan in the back. Remember the lawyer in, in Defending Jacob is named Jonathan. Um, it's, it's my husband. So anybody who reads Defending Jacob, which has been on the New York Times bestseller list a million weeks, um, it's about Jonathan. I've also read a book called Trust Your Eyes by Linwood Barclay. Do you, do you know that book? A fantastic, wonderful sort of um, contemporary rear window. And I enjoyed that tremendously. And there's a new book out by a woman named Becky Masterman, which is about a retired FBI agent, a woman, um, who, and I've never read about a 59-year-old 59, 59 woman who's a retired FBI agent, and she's tough and she's fabulous, and it's really a wonderful book. So, I mean, one of the secrets, that one of the things that happens that they don't tell you about being um, an author is that the joy of reading changes considerably. Because now, when I read a book, I'm reading it to see whether, is it better than mine? Is it worse than mine? You know, how, how did they do this? I'm, I'm untangling the book from the beginning. A good, if it's a good book, I'm a little jealous. If it's a bad book, I'm like, how come this got published? You know, so that kind of thing. And also, I've now started, do not tell. Do not tell this. And don't do it with mine. Okay, I will tell you this if you don't do it with mine. But I read the end first. Because I know it's like, oh, no, don't do it with mine. Because even if you read the last page, you wouldn't know, so it doesn't matter. But because if I, as an author, if I love a book and I know what, how it ends, I can start at the beginning and see how the author did it, see how the author led me along, see where they hid the clues, see where the foreshadowing is, see how the structure of the story works. And it's incredibly educational to do that. Um, don't do it with mine, though. You don't need that much education. <laughs> so are we out of... Yes, of course. If I got a call from Martin Scorsese to, pick, to film one of my books, who would I pick to be in it? Would I say yes? <laughs> you know... You know, the, the question is, I mean, it's an interesting question. The short answer to would I say yes to Martin Scorsese is, I love Martin Scorsese, of course I would say yes. Um, but it's a tough one, actually. I mean, I, I would embrace having my books be movies. The, the Other Woman would be a fabulous movie. My new book, The Wrong Girl, which comes out in the fall, um, the, the cover of it is back there. Do you see that? Did I leave it on the table back there? Um, it's blue. Maybe I'll find it for you. Anyway, I'll show you. Anyway, The Wrong Girl that comes out in the fall. This is the sequel. They're standalone, but you can read them in any order. And you can read them in any order. The Wrong Girl, which comes out in the fall, is about an adoption agency that may be reuniting birth parents with the wrong children. See, you said ooh. And that means that's going to be a good movie, right? Um, 
But, and my books are very cinematic, and I write them that way, to, to really take you to the place where they are, to really um, draw you into the story and take you to a new world. But, for instance, Sue Grafton has told me that she would never sell Kinsey Malone to the movies, because one of the joys of reading, right, is that you imagine what the people look like, and you imagine the situation, you imagine even how they talk. Um, and if somebody puts a, an actor in that role, then forevermore, that's going to be how you envision that character. So a beloved character like Kinsey Malone maybe is better off staying between in the pages of the book. Uh, and so that is why, if Martin, Scor if Martin Scorsese is listening, hi, you know, <laughs> call me. But um, I'm not, it's not in the top of my mind thinking about my books being movies. What's in the top of my mind is having the books be fabulous books, having you have your adventure when you're reading it on your Kindle or reading it as a book book. I don't care which way you're reading it, but then the story is in your imagination. I've created a new world for you, not somebody else presenting you with something to see. Does that make sense? Good. Yes, one last question. Where did I go to college and what was my major? I went to Western College for Women in Oxford, Ohio, which is Mount Holyoke's Western campus. Um, it was founded so long ago, that's when Ohio was the West. It's in Oxford, Ohio. So Mount Holyoke. What I studied, huh, depending, well, they thought I was an English major, but actually I think I was majoring in rock and roll records and the Beatles. I, I, sometimes I went to class. I was a terrible, if I, I was a terrible student, unless I loved whatever it was. So I loved Shakespeare. I would just sit up in my room and read what I wanted to read. And from time, from time to time, I'd go to other classes. I guess I can admit this now. Nobody ever knew that. Um, if I had one thing in my life to do over, I might have listened in class in college. I might have paid attention. I didn't. But I was an English major with much delight. My par much to my parents' chagrin, um, being absolutely unemployable and skillless when I graduated. But it was most more that um, I had a liberal arts education, which I loved, which taught me a little bit about everything. And that's, very, that's a very necessary skill as a television journalist, to know a little bit about everything, and a very necessary skill as an author to be able to know where to look and where to go and how themes work and how the world works and how, how, and again, and this is so perfect, but again, how to tell a story. And that's what I learned in college and that's what I hope I keep learning every day. Thank you so much for coming.